Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Billy. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Working With Others group in Netcon, New Jersey, and I want to thank the committee for having me here tonight. I'm also going to keep a close eye on my watch because I know that there's probably a few people here who know it's July 4th and there's some fireworks, so I don't know about the possibility of getting over there, but I assure you that I won't talk for two hours. Um, (laughs) It's by God's grace, Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, participating in the three legacies of this fellowship that I haven't had to take a drink since January the 5th of 1990. And for that, I am truly grateful. And um, I want to say a couple of things right off the bat that I understand and um, just want anyone here to know, if you're new, that this is without a doubt a podium and not a pedestal. And um, if you are new and you have trouble because I have a suit and tie on, I, I identify with you. And if, if you're sitting there and looking at me in a suit and tie and thinking that because I have a suit and tie on, I maybe can't even possibly be an alcoholic or have drank as bad as you. I really identify with you because I suffered from that delusion for a long time in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, looking at people and, you know, if you were different than me, you couldn't possibly know what I was going through. And um, it says uh, on the program I happen to have the privilege of being a past delegate and a delegate to the General Service Conference, and I'm not going to get on any kind of service soapbox tonight except for one. And it's the same soapbox and the only one that I usually stand on. I'll say it once and I'll get over with it. If anyone's ever told you that just because you haven't been in jail, you don't have a message to carry to recovering members of Alcoholics Anonymous in jail, they've lied to you. In fact, it's completely the opposite. Most of us that have been sentenced to any kind of jail time have a hard time getting back in. Recovering members of Alcoholics Anonymous who are full-fledged members of this fellowship depend on people not like me, people who can get easily cleared back into facilities. And, um, you know, I, I often talk about the story I heard of this 27-year-old. He was a hardcore gangbanger before he recovered. And um, he would say that every Thursday night he walked out to the fence line of this minimum security facility and he would wait at the fence line for this woman. She was 63 or 64 years old, never did a day in jail in her life, And whether her old beat-up station wagon came through the guardhouse or not made or broke his week and the subject. And um, obviously I have some personal experience as to why that's important to me, but um, for me that's still a place that I do service. Um, Correction service is, is very important to me. I find very few places where I run into contact with truly alcoholics who are ready to hear some kind of message of hope. And uh, I said my sobriety date, I have a home group, and, um, you know, how it was, how I got here, how it is today, my experience, strength, and hope might be different from someone sitting here, and I am not spiritually arrogant enough to think that my way is the only way or it's my way or the highway. Uh, I understand a little bit. I'm, I am a little different than the last time I spoke in Pennsylvania. Um, I wear glasses, a little older, a couple more pounds have gray hair some places, uh, (laughs) let's see, Um, so, but I'm going to tell you what, if anyone invites me to go to Denny's tonight, I'm going to say no, Uh, I'm going to try to stop a bad trend, Um, you know, uh, not too many years ago, uh, young and dumb Billy, with another Billy, and a couple other people wound up in a Denny's after an AA event in Philadelphia, and It's a long story, but let's just say uh, I didn't find out about the Philadelphia criminal justice system, and and I'm glad for that. Um, And it just, I got sober young. I can't help that. And uh, I identify with people that got sober young, and I know that doesn't make me different. It doesn't make me unique. Being Irish Catholic doesn't make me different and unique and doesn't mean that I'm an alcoholic. I've heard it said that it might mean that I was a little bit more thirsty and guilty right from the get-go, but other than that, I know that just because of who my parents were did not make me an alcoholic. I, I know that, and the doctor's opinion makes that very clear to me. I also know now that where I was raised and how I was raised 
did teach me a lot of bad life skills and living tools. And I wasn't raised in a manner that's the same as the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm here to very honestly say that just because I got sober on January 5th of 1990, putting the drink down was a big battle. Putting down the way and the skills and the tools I was raised to deal with life is a bigger battle for this alcoholic. And the big book talks about it. Um, I'll very, I'll give you one example of, of my alcoholism because it's alive inside me as I stand here. And it describes why I drank and why I kept drinking. Now, I don't know about anyone else here, but if I would just talk about drinking and I'm going to just give a period of time of like 14 hours, because that's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon to 5 o'clock in the morning. So that's a good stretch of time for me to talk about. Because if I started drinking at 3, chances are at 5 o'clock in the morning I would still be drinking. But if I wake up the next day at 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon and the night before has been a complete tragedy like it usually was, my thinking tells me that there was probably 15 to 30 minutes in the night before that I can remember that made it all worth it. Where I was the center of attention, where I was the life of the party, where I was the guy that was doing something that other people thought was crazy, but I got attention because of it. I could have 13 and a half hours of pure hell and misery, but I don't remember that when I wake up the next morning. I identify with the 15 minutes to a half an hour when I find something good about what happened the night before. And I live for that 15 minutes to a half an hour again, knowing well that it's going to bring another 13 and a half hours of misery. And, you know, I, I've been a, com a com uh, how do you say this the best, um, the most honest? Competition, I have a hard time with because I love to compete, love to be better than, love to be really better than. And um, about three years ago, I had a couple of knee surgeries, and I was going to a AA picnic in Chicago. My alcoholism alive and well inside me. And uh, I had just told the doctor, or he had told me, Billy, no more softball. Now, for a good part of my early AA career, sober softball was my recovery program. And, um, and I know those two words should very rarely go together. You know, I know that today. <laughs> Very rarely do those two words belong together. But anyway, I was walking down Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, and I'm looking out at this picnic, and I see the diamond, and what I mean, the baseball diamond. And it's clear to me that there's going to be some kind of game there today. And the first thought that went through my head was that the doctor was talking about league, not pickup games. He was talking about <laughs> league softball. And... um not too much longer than that, I wound up in left field, where if you just had two knee surgeries, you probably don't belong to me. But I wound up there because that's what I play, because that's what I'm good at. And sometime around the second or third inning, there was a guy up at bat who I didn't like and I didn't know, but I'm very capable of not liking you and not knowing you. <laughs> and um, the reason I didn't like him was because he looked better than me. He looked like a good athlete. He looked like I had seen him hit the first inning already. He ripped the line drive. I'd seen him make a play in the field. This guy was good. He he ripped a wicked line drive towards left center field, and anybody who's played baseball for a week, never mind as long as I know, would know that it would bounce once off your glove, off the ball, off the ground, into my glove. I would throw it to second base. I would hold the runner. It would be an easy play. I gotta tell you, that night, as I was walking towards Lakeshore Drive, some eight hours later, and my knee was all cut up and swollen, and blood was all dried around my knee and my sock, the only thing that I could think about was that may have been the greatest catch I've ever made, and it's worth all the pain that I'm going through right now. That's the only thought that went through my mind. The pain was secondary, really. And to make matters worse, this guy named Lewis came up to my home group in Chicago last summer, and he goes, you know, Billy, that's still the greatest catch I've ever seen. I, I don't need to hear things like that. <laughs> and the reason I tell that story is because that's a big part of my drinking. I don't want to go through a lot of war stories, but that's a big part of my drinking. That story coincides with one. There's a, a college town upstate New York named Cortland. Now, I don't know if anyone here has been there, but it's like any other upstate New York college town in when I'm out drinking, I can be out drinking with 20 people. And the next day, 19 of those people can tell me, Billy, you took it too far last night. 
Billy, you really crossed the line. And one out of those 20 can say, Billy, that was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And that's all I listen to. Or somebody can say, Billy, I can't believe you did that. That was great. That's, I don't hear the other 19. I hear the one. I hear the one person who I feel I came in touch with or I feel made me feel special. And, um, you know, one time I was upstate in Cortland at a fraternity party, and uh, I was visiting friends up there, and there was some kind of crazy beach party going on, and there was like 10,000 pounds of sand all over the floor and all over the house, and everyone was in the middle of the winter in upstate New York, and everyone was dressed in beach attire, and I'm in the basement of this fraternity house, and it's packed, and, you know, I'm just trying to drink and trying to drink. And I have to go to the bathroom, and there's a line going up the stairs around a bend to get into the men's room. And, like, there's no way I can – there's no way I can hold enough beer and stay on that line and not run out. I mean, I'm just being honest. I mean, that's what I would think about. And the better thought to me about an hour later was that there was sand all over the floor, and I was at this bar. It would be a lot easier to just relieve myself right there. Now – there was a fraternity member or two who lived in that house that didn't think that was a good idea. And uh, me and a couple of friends of mine took a pretty good beating that night, deservedly so. If someone pissed on my floor, I'd probably beat him too. I mean, but the only thing I remember the next day is the guy who told me that what I did was great. The other people who got hit because I was an idiot, I don't hear that. And... If you put that together with my compulsion, I've never been able to not have the second drink, ever. You know, I was raised by an Irish Catholic cop and an Irish Catholic mom in New York, and I was raised to believe that as long as you don't smoke it, snort it, or stick it in your arms, it's okay, and that we drink and they drug. Those are my rules from an early, early age. And I was raised to believe that what goes on in the house stays in the house, and in our family, people don't get divorced. They just don't talk to each other. Um, uh, now, I'm not saying any of this makes me an alcoholic, but I learned some real twisted lessons. Now, I have 42 first cousins, which where I come from is not a lot. That's, you know, it's kind of normal. My mother comes from nine. My dad comes from ten. It's uh, My dad comes from eight. My mother comes from nine. So a couple of kids each, it's 42. But what that means is that every spring, it's like christening, baptism, confirmation, first communion, christening, first communion, confirmation, graduation. I mean, every weekend there is something going on. And what I learned about every weekend is that every weekend the men and women are separate. And every weekend Uncle Frank brings the cards and the chips and every weekend, Uncle Frank has the bookie's number, if, especially if it's like Thanksgiving and New Year's Day when there's a lot of football games on. You know, and I learned that every weekend, either my mom or one of my aunts would be in a pretty much all-out brawl with my dad or one of their husbands because we don't give up our keys in my family. Men don't give up their keys. And, you know, that was just something that I've seen every a, a lot. And... I'm not saying it's right or wrong or maybe an alcoholic. It's just where I come from. It's just what I learned. And, you know, I didn't come in a place that taught you not to drink and drive. My dad was the kind of guy, you know, in New York, there's a lot of um, tolls. And you go to Yankee Stadium or Giant Stadium or, or Shea Stadium to a jet game, and you're going to go through a toll. And most people are afraid to go through a toll booth. And my mother, my dad was the kind of guy who he actually brought an ice-cold beer for the guy working in the toll booth, you know. He just... <laughs> He just felt that that was his job as a fellow civil servant to take care of the guy who was sweating his ass off, you know. Um, so, I mean, I this is one of the things I learned as a kid growing up. I never really saw anything wrong with any of this. Um, when I was taught how to drive, my dad pulled up in front of a deli in Long Island. He said, go in and get me two Robert Burns cigars, three Schaefer Tall Boys. He switched seats. I got in the car, and we drove around by the water, and he smoked Robert Burns cigars and drank Schaefer Tall Boys. I mean, it's just... I never remember going on a trip with my dad and my uncles when there wasn't a traveler between each guy's legs. And if you ask me what my first drink was, I really can't identify it because I don't know what counts as your first drink. You know, splitting a beer with your dad at Yankee Stadium or a jet game in my family isn't your first drink. It's it's something you do with your dad and he tells you not to tell your mom. I mean, um, 
you know, I, I still sometimes when I see a, a Schaefer, what has the pop top, and you remember the old can openers that had to put the hole on the other side to make it drink? I mean, I mean, I grew up with my dad drinking like that, and I spent weekend after weekend, I knew the rules in a bar before I even picked up a drink. I knew every third drink was free. I knew that a man kept his dollars out on the bill. I never saw my dad once ever go to a bank, ever. I can't even remember him once ever going to a bank. I remember him, if it was payday, on the police department, he would tell me that he was off that day, and we would take a trip to pick up his check. We'd go to a bar where he cashed it. Then he'd go to, like, three other bars and pay off his tabs. And then he'd give my mother some money, and he always said that he kept some money from himself. I mean, that was just, I learned that from a young age. And, um, you know, I love my dad to death. Uh, and he died of this disease not too long ago. Um, but that was just normal for me, being raised like that. And what happened to me is not different than I'm sure anyone else here, is that uh, things in my house got pretty bad and pretty sick. And my dad was very successful at his job, and outside the house a hero and inside the house a terror. And um, I learned another thing about my family before I picked up my first drink, which was that we don't use the alcoholism word. That word is very elusive in my family, still today, for a great many of them. Because to, draw, to describe somebody alcoholic, if you describe somebody's symptoms as alcoholism, you would be describing, you would be blanketing a good portion of the family. So we had a lot of code words like high stress job, you know, um, <laughs> a, a lot of things like that, rough day, um, you know, under a lot of pressure, you know, the union hasn't gotten a raise, we've been waiting three years for a contract. <laughs> Things like that were just commonplace, but never alcoholism. Never, ever, ever. And um, I also learned that you might not lie, steal. I was raised with those. But it is okay to lie to defend or, you know, deny the existence of alcoholism. That was a steadfast rule in my family. You know, and I can just tell you this one last story before I picked up a drink, is that I was up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go on a Boy Scout trip, and I was in the shower, and I was getting changed, and my dad was coming on this trip with me, and it had been planned a long time, and um, the fact that he didn't show up, that's really not the brunt of the story. The brunt of the story is, is that the phone rang. You could hear the IRA rebel music blasting through the phone as my mother was talking to him when he was in some gin mill in Queens. And my mother hung up the phone and said, Billy, your dad made an arrest last night. He won't be coming home. Now, I knew my dad didn't make an arrest. If he did, he made it hours ago. I knew he was in Patrick's Pub or somewhere else. But I also knew that it's my job to show up at that Boy Scout trip, to tell everyone else there that my dad made an arrest last night, he continues his hero status in the community, and the house was just holy terror. And when he finally left, I tried everything to get rid of the pain, and I hated my mom, and my mom passed away not too recently also. And um, I'll get into a little that, but what I can tell you is, and I have to honestly say this is, I really liked my mom by the time she was diagnosed with her cancer, but I can honestly tell you, and I'm not glad she's gone by any stretch of the imagination. But the eight months that I had with her while she was dying, I really grew to like her. Really grew to like her for who she was. Because I hated her for who she was. I really did. Hated her for making my dad, the hero, leave. Because he was my hero. I didn't care. I knew that we couldn't have glass on the wedding frames anymore. I knew that we had to put plastic on them because they got broken too much when dad came in in the middle of the night. I knew that mom hid dad's gun all the time when he was drunk. I knew all that stuff, but I did not want him out of that house. When he left that house, I started getting involved in all kinds of violence at school. And that's the first place that I know that I can look back that my alcoholism escalated, fighting and fighting and fighting. And um, I tried Boy Scouts, and I tried sports, and I tried everything. But I'm here to tell you that one night when I was about 15 years old, and, uh, you know, I'm a product of the late 70s and 80s, and, um, you know, I grew up in the back of, like, Old Novas and Chevelles and Dusters and Malibu Classics and Monte Carlos, listening to Ozzy and Black Sabbath and 
One night I pulled into a 7-Eleven with a bunch of guys, and I got my own eight-pack of Miller shorties. And I can identify my life from changing that night, because that's pretty much the first drink I ever took. That's when drinking did for me what it describes in a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's when I found something that worked that Boy Scouts and sports and staying over at somebody else's house, I finally found the answer to the thing that I had tried to find for so many years, which was something that got rid of that hole in my stomach. But you, I've had time to look back now on my sobriety and on my drinking days, and I couldn't be able to tell you all the stuff I know today when I was a year or two years sober. But I have no doubt in my mind that I was an alcoholic at age 15. I have no doubt in my mind at all. And I have no doubt in my mind that other people I've met were alcoholics age 9, 10, whenever they were drinking, because I had the mental obsession for the first drink, and I had the physical compulsion for the second drink when I started drinking then. And I've identified a couple of things that I know were different. See, I run into friends of mine. Every once in a while, I'll meet somebody in an airport traveling for business or talk to them, and they partied with me. They got into a little trouble, but they didn't go down the same road as me. They somehow, like, were able to get married, do this, go to school. It's, like, confusing because, you know, they were up against the fence with the state police behind me in Sunken Meadow State Park because I thought it was a good idea to take the state flag and crawl up the flagpole at 4 o'clock in the morning or... You know, like me, they agreed that we couldn't find firewood, but that the lifeguard stand is perfectly good wood. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, you just knock it over and you just get a little gasoline from a car and you light that up. You know, these guys agreed that those were good ideas too, but they weren't alcoholic. And what I know about my drinking as a teenager is this. When I was in the back of one of those cars listening to Ozzy, going to a party on a Friday or Saturday night. And we're going to a party, and you know in high school everything's exaggerated, so if it's going to be two kegs, it's ten. If it's going to be three kegs, it's twenty. But let's just say that there were really going to be five kegs somewhere. If I was in the back of that car with four other guys, and I did not have a backup six-pack to bring with me, I would be in sheer terror and panic. I mean sheer terror. Because I can't possibly fathom the idea of going someplace and depending on someone else to keep my alcohol flowing. That the worst thing that could happen to this young boy would to be in that party on Long Island, in the back of somebody's parents' house or away, and being the guy with the black hose from the keg in my hand, and that keg running out, and me not having anything. So I'm the guy who always had a backup six. Who if I'm walking in your parents' house, I'm throwing it in the bushes right outside the front door, you know? I have a backup six-pack there. I'm the guy who at midnight or 11 o'clock, I'm taking the extra Michelob and I'm putting it in the Tupperware drawer or the tinfoil drawer or, the, or, where, or where the sodas are, you know. But I'm also a blackout drinker from way back, which means that I had good intentions, but I got a lot of my friends busted because their mom, when she's going for Tupperware, gets my Michelob. When she's going for tinfoil, she gets my Michelob. But, you know, I know other kids, they don't go into sheer panic like that. They're not... They don't walk into a party with tons of alcohol, worried that they don't have alcohol hidden. I do. You know, I remember learning how to play a game called quarters, and I'm sure some of you know it. You know, when you bounce this stupid quarter off somebody's parents' kitchen table and into a shot glass, and if you get it in, you point at someone else and they drink. I thought drinking games were painful. Nothing was more painful than to wait for someone to tell me to drink, you know? <laughs> Nothing, you know. I never found a punishment in someone pointing at me and saying, Billy, it's your turn to drink. You know, I found it punishing when they pointed at someone else. I found it punishing when, like, I never got called on. I found that punishing. I was different than those other kids. Also, I was not that big in high school, and I would be around guys who were 6'2 already and 250, and I could drink them under the table. Now, I'm a blackout drinker. I don't remember anything after 11 o'clock, but I'm the guy who gets you home. I'm the guy who's blacked out, might not remember, but I'm steadfast, you know. I don't pass out on you. I don't puke on you that night. I'm a next day puker, you know. I'm a, I'm a pass out at 6 in the morning, but I keep going all night. And um, I realized from an early age that I had some differences, and I got in some trouble. And um, I wound up, you know, going out all synonymous when I was young, 15 years old, my first meeting. And um, 
I didn't get sober till I was 23 this time, and 15 to 23, I could tell you, sometimes looks like a phase. Well, if it was a phase, it was one hell of a phase. When I hate AA, I think, boy, that was probably a phase. I'm just not an alcoholic. I just was what they told me in high school. I had some anger problems. I hadn't dealt with my parents' divorce. Um, that wasn't a phase. Uh, but I can tell you this. When I wound up going to outpatient treatment at Catholic Charities in Long Island, this alcoholic was in a room with like 20 other men. They were all in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And the only thing I thought of looking around that room was, what a bunch of losers. I will never be in treatment when I'm 30 or 40 years old. I never thought about thinking, Billy, you beat these people here by 15 years to 20 on average. What's wrong with your life? I never turned it around and looked at it that way. I just looked at everyone else and said, my life will never be like this. And um, I could not give up drinking. Now, if you're here tonight and you haven't given up drinking yet, I'm not here to judge you. I don't know when God's seed grows. I know tonight I can only carry the message not to drunk. I know for me, I don't want to cast any kind of dispersion on any of those earlier meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous I attended. Because somehow or another, when the time came, I knew where to go for help. I knew where the experts were. And my drinking really never changed. And I have, you know, lots of stories and, you know, um, range of games and going to the garden and going, you know, getting kicked out of a Def Leppard concert at Giant Stadium, you know, all those stories that I have. I mean, you know, and I think about them now and I kind of laugh to myself, but God, I mean, traveling with me was a terror. I mean, you never knew what was going to happen. I, I thought I was funny. I thought I was the life of the party, but other people, they really got tired of me and um, I could see why now. And, um, you know, I know some people here, you know, there are certain places that don't arrest you. They just take a Polaroid of you, and they tell you to sign a form that you'll never come back again. And, um, you know, I've signed one of them at the Garden. I've signed one of them at Yankee Stadium. I've signed one of them at Shea Stadium. I've signed one of them at the Long Island Arena. Um, you know, you just promise never to come back. But the thing is, is the next day when I wake up completely sober, the insanity in the second step for me is that I take the first drink again. I take that first drink because I'm looking to get rid of the pain. And that's really, you know, as much as... I don't like to say that I didn't have a good time drinking because I had some good times. I like to say that it didn't work for me. I've had a better time sober. I've been given a life beyond my wildest dreams in sobriety. I've done some of the craziest, nuttiest things as a young alcoholic getting sober in New York. Um, and some of those times are so near and dear to my heart that I don't want to take him away from anyone else because I know that myself I can get a little judgmental and rigid. All of a sudden, you know, I'm a little older. I want to say that I was never doing that. Well, yeah, I was, you know. I was leaving the diner at 69th Street with 12 other people to go to the 50th anniversary of AA in Canada in 1993 with like 20 bucks in my pocket, you know, and we drove up all night and didn't sleep. But those trips, they're near and dear to my heart now. And you know, what happened to me was, it's very simple. Drinking became part of my life, part of my everyday life. And I didn't do one thing that didn't revolve around drinking. And by the time I was 21, my dad had gotten me a job. And I like to wake up around 3.30 in the afternoon. I like to go to 7-Eleven and get a big gulp to get rid of my sore throat. I like to get a pack of, I was smoking Marlboros still at that time. I like to get a fresh pack of Marlboro Reds. I like to get a Nestle's Crunch Bar, and that's my breakfast at 3.30 in the afternoon. And I like to start the day. And I like to live the terror all over again. And I'm the son that was, you had to explain why he wasn't at a wedding. And I'm the son who missed his brother's graduation. And I'm the son who, when he was passed out on the lawn in the front of your house with the car still running and other people are walking their younger kids out to the bus stop, that embarrasses his mother because someone has to say to my mother that they've been knocking on my window and I won't wake up, but the car's running and there's a beer between my legs and, uh, you know, and saliva is running down a steering wheel. That's who I am. That's who I am without this program. And um, so regardless of all the good times, that's who I became. And I got carried for a long time because of what my dad did for a living um, until I was 21 until I got a job. But I remember the first time I got locked up and this highway patrolman told me I had a problem 
And I told him that I was usually the guy that drove people home. And I was in a DWI trailer in Hop Hog, Long Island. And um, I remember I blew a .25 that night. And, and I was, you know, about 170 pounds. And he told me that I might have a problem. And, uh, you know, my dad had told me that as long as I never used drugs, I didn't have a problem. And I didn't like pot. I smoked it a few times, you know. Wound up zoning out on a couch watching the wall at three o'clock in the morning. That wasn't my kind of drinking. My kind of drinking is you can't be in one place for more than a half an hour. There's always something better going on someplace else. That's my kind of drinking. I like to go wherever I know something better is going on and wherever I'm going to add to the party. And, um, my dad, I just got to say this. He was probably one of the best people I ever drank with. Um, he drank just like I did. He could never have one drink. He liked to, like, start out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He liked to, like, roll in at 6 or 7 in the morning. And, um, you know, that's how I drank for a long time. And uh, I wound up in and out of AA, and I heard lots of things. And I'll tell you one thing I heard that I still remember today. Is I heard a guy say they didn't get hangovers anymore. Now, that was just, that was like saying that there was going to be peace in the Middle East to me at that age. I mean, I couldn't believe that, that he didn't get hangovers, and he didn't get hangovers because he didn't drink a day at a time. Now, right after I heard that, I ran into a very good-looking female bartender who told me that I didn't prepare to drink good enough. And she told me that I didn't coat my stomach properly. She told me lots of things. Now, I just got to tell you that at age 17... Not drinking a day at a time, preparing to drink, not drinking seemed a little drastic. So I went with the other door. And I got the results that the other door gives you. See, because life will start to change. And, um, you know, my mom, she started getting advice from people in the enemy camp. We all know them. Um, and uh, she never really stayed there because I think it was too hard for her to deal with the total alcoholism of the whole family. But she did get enough advice from people at times to be pretty hard with me. You know, and we all say, you know, that there's nothing worse than a belly full of booze and a head full of AA. But my good friend Todd, I have to give him credit, he says for a young alcoholic there might be something worse than that. And that's a belly full of booze and a mom's head with Alan on knowledge. Because that is very, very bad for a young alcoholic. And... um the reason I say that is because things started to change when I was drinking and not behaving. Is It's one thing to be not allowed out. Not allowed out means my mom goes to sleep at 10. I go out the window at 10.30. I come back in the window at 4. Mom wakes up and sees me the next day and says, did you learn your lesson? I say yes. That's not allowed out. Not allowed in is a whole different story. Not allowed in... Not allowed in and not allowed out are very, very different. I mean, I don't exactly know where that line in the sand is. I don't know where the other side preaches to have that line. But I know this, that not allowed in, it works to a degree a lot better than not allowed out. Not allowed out, I'm on a cot. I have a TV, some food. Sounds like another place I've been. But not allowed in, not allowed in is very different. Not allowed in... And I remember one time picking up the phone to call my mother collect. And I was in some trouble. And I remember the operator saying, uh, that number does not collect, accept collect calls. And I said, oh, you must be really mistaken. I'm sure it does. And the operator said, oh, no, the computer says right there, no collect calls. And, uh, you know, I learned. I learned that my mother had to do that because she didn't have the strength to hear my voice and say no. That when they said there was a collect call from Billy, she would say yes. But that somehow she had to learn from people to just not hear my voice. Now, at the time, I thought that was about the most horrible thing you could ever teach a mother in the world. <laughs> now I know that there's a reason for that. I know that because I've worked with a lot of other young alcoholics who, and yeah, alcoholics of all age, who I know that I can't carry them. I know I have this old AA pamphlet. It's like the second pamphlet AA ever made, and it says our purpose is to help the suffering alcoholic if he wishes. You know, those three lines, those three words. And, you know, by the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had pretty much used up every person and friend in the world. 
I had a guy that I worked for that had worked with my dad. He had retired and worked where I work now, and he told me that if I was like my dad, I'd never wind up lasting with him. And I thought that was an insult. You know, he told me my dad was an alcoholic and a booze hound. And God knows I knew that, but I didn't want to admit it. And, um, you know, for me, it's very simple. It doesn't make me an alcoholic. But, you know, when I was 23 years of age, I was going to a Christmas party. I went to that party. I did what everyone else does that I, that I hung out with. I drank before the party. I drank at the party. I drank before the party with people I worked with that I liked. So that way I could go to this party and deal with people I didn't like. And I went out to gin mills afterwards, and I got into a fatal car accident that night coming home. And that doesn't make me an alcoholic. And I want to say very clearly that the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is clear. We're men and women that lost the ability to control our drinking. We're not men and women that were homeless or divorced or bankrupt or anything, went to jail. We're men and women that lost the ability to control our drinking. That's just what happened to me. Now, I want to say that... Um, when it was time for me to put up the flag, one of the paradoxes that I can't stand about Alcoholics Anonymous is that you asked me to stop drinking when I needed to drink the most. And I find that with people I work with. That AA brings us to the jumping off point that the big book talks about, where to drink is to die, but to not drink feels like you're going to die. And But the paradox in my life was that I was dealing with so much pain and shame and anguish and anger that I really needed to drink, but yet I couldn't drink. But I found that that's the place God delivers alcoholics to. That's the place that you're delivered to to make, you know, the choice for that small kit of spiritual tools that the big book talks about. And I didn't grab every tool out of that kit, I can assure you. In fact, I grabbed the I did better than tool or I was worse than. When I was going to early meetings on Long Island, I thought I was tougher than everybody. If you hit two poles, I hit three. You kicked one bounce's ass, I kicked two. I was a raise you guy. You know, if you shared this, then I shared and I raised you like three more. You know, that's how I was. And I hated AA, and I hated the people in AA. And it's funny because when I go to work every day, I'll tell you who I really hated. When I got out of jail, I was going to this meeting in New York City. I was on the Upper East Side with all these guys that wore suits to work every day and carried briefcases, and God, did I hate these people, and God, does God have a sense of humor. You know, because I go to work basically dressed like this every day. I go to work carrying a briefcase. I go to work with the people who I hated in AA. The people who I believed could have never drank like I drank. They looked too nice. They looked like they were too nice to people. They looked like they were soft. Well, I'm soft now. I don't think I could do the things I used to do. In fact, that's one of the things sometimes I think that keeps me sober. I'm not sure that I have it in me anymore. I've, uh, you guys have softened me up a bit. And, um... You know, I don't want to say that I don't believe in miracles. I do believe in them, but more than that, I depend on them. And that's why I believe in them. Because I've seen them right here in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not here to give a step workshop, but I will say this. Um, when I was in jail, one of the miracles that happened to me is like I said, I have the capable of hating you and not knowing you. You can get up to get a cup of coffee. I've already made a million judgments in a meeting by the time you sit down. Um, I heard a tape. We had a speaker's library in Suffolk County out at Yapank. And um, we were allowed to have a Walkman. This is pre-CD, so I'm dating myself. And we were allowed to have a Walkman that didn't have AM, FM, as long as it was just cassette, because it didn't interfere with the corrections office's radios. And we were allowed to listen to AA tapes. And I heard a tape. And this speaker said that time, recovering time, inside a correctional facility doesn't count. What that meant to me was that all speakers, I won't even use the word, but that I've had enough with anyone who possibly has a tape. They're all morons. They're not alcoholic either. They probably never drank either. And I'm never listening to another tape. And inside changed me for a lot of reasons. It obviously didn't make me a softer person because to survive inside where I was required um, some brain power and uh, using your brain. But I will say this, it changed my outlook on life. For so long I was convinced that because I didn't use drugs, I didn't have a problem. And it finally sat in my this thick-headed Irish brain of mine one day as I was sitting on a cot 
looking out at the fence with the wire on it that I was inside a correctional facility and I didn't use drugs. So it kind of like added up in my head for the first time. Drinking is bad. It's bad for Billy, you know? And it's funny because there was this one guy, he was like, crack was like immense proportion. I mean, just, it was really taken off. It was the new drug. My dad always considered himself a BC narc, a before crack narc. And he always said that he was glad that he was a before crack narc because crack had just really changed the whole scene. But this one crackhead, who was it, and his name was Spider, I'll never forget that he's telling me about my life. He's saying, man, you must be one of those Irish guys who just can't drink, become a maniac when he drinks or something like that. I'm like, this guy's like sentenced to, he's going upstate. He's down here in a new trial. And he, or he knows that I can't drink. You know, he knows I can't drink and he's never drank with me. He knew I was in here for drinking related and he never even asked me what I was charged with. So I had some revelations inside there. And, um, I also learned about the sanctity of Alcoholics Anonymous behind the walls, that it's not to be messed with, and that people who take it serious will tell the other inmates that are serious that this is not to be messed with. It's not a place to move contraband over to the other side of the facility. It's not a place to show up too late. It's not a place to put your name on. You know, the group I was in was pretty serious about recovery. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I was in the library one day for whatever reason, and there was a tape, top of the pile. It said, Tom I. Aberdeen, North Carolina. And for some reason, I'm sure God had something to do with this, I picked up that tape. And I listened to it on my cot in my Walkman, and I listened to a man who had killed two pedestrians drinking and driving. A man who at that time, that when a tape was made, was like 30-something years sober, and he'd wound up becoming a warden of a correctional facility. And... That tape gave me the hope that I had been looking for. That tape gave me the hope that, see, because I was convinced that because of what I did, my life was over. And that tape gave me the hope that if you haven't heard your hope yet, keep going to meetings. I know this true story for me. I've heard more stories similar to mine out of people that look nothing like me more than people who look just like me. That's the truth. But what I also learned is, if your ears like mine work 100% and your mind is closed, you don't hear. You don't listen. That's what happened to me. And that tape gave me the hope. And, you know, I wound up living in Manhattan, and um, I depended on miracles. I didn't believe in them. I depended on them. You know, for a while, I had friends in AA on Long Island. I went to meetings in the city. My mom wouldn't let me home, and I had to understand that, and I now know. I thought a 90 and 90 should excuse 23 years of being a complete jackass, you know? Hey, come on, I got 90 days. What's going on? I've learned today that we usually hurt those closest to us the most, that those who are closest to us, we bring the most devastation. I wasn't allowed home my first two Christmases outside. Because my sisters and my sister and two brothers felt that I bring too much disruption to the family. And they only came home from college for a little bit of time and my mom sided with them. And I spent 79th Street Workshop in New York City celebrating Thanksgiving there and celebrating Christmas there. And I'm a better person for it today. I know that. And, um, families are a funny thing and what I've learned about families is this. When I finally was invited back there, and now I'm like four years sober, or three years sober, and they're finally going to let me back, at three years sober, they're saying, you're still going to those meetings, right? Still going to those meetings, Billy, right? Still in AA, right? And I know families like that. But then a couple of years later, fast forward, and it's after Thanksgiving dinner, and I want to go out to a meeting, they're like, you really got to leave? You know? <laughs> you still got to go to them? Because they don't understand. They don't have the disease. They don't understand that a whole holiday day with them, I really need to be at a meeting, you know? <laughs> they, they don't understand that. But I do, you know? And I'm very grateful to the men and women in New York City who taught me a lot of basic, basic AA. I mean like beginner's AA that I needed to hear. You know, and there was a man named Winston who saved my life. 
And he saved my life because he was kind to me. And not because he shoved the big book down my throat, but because he was just a kind person. And he was a black man. And I can tell you honestly, there weren't a lot of black men in my house growing up. And we would walk down Broadway, and he'd have his Malcolm X baseball hat on, and I've had my Notre Dame baseball hat on. And he taught me more about life than my dad ever taught me. But you see, one of the things I learned in AA was that most of the things I learned as a boy growing up that made you a man don't make you a man. And most of the things that I was taught don't make you a man, make you a man. But that's just how I was taught growing up. You see, if you coach Little League or a Boy Scout volunteer and you deposit your check in the bank, you've sold out. That's how I was raised. You've given in to the other team. You've sold out your manhood. If you don't show up after three days of being paid, if you don't volunteer because you can't be trusted, those are the guys my dad hung out with. Those are the guys I was a bat boy for on this on their softball team. Those were men. So Winston kind of like retaught me a lot of that stuff. Winston was also very hard, though, on certain things, you know, because you would ask him something like, how do you get out of debt? He would say, pay your bills, you know. <laughs> now that's, you would think you would need a, something a little bit more complicated. But he didn't believe in complicated solutions. He believed that there was an easy solution for most things. And Winston more than anything else, was not a page quoter, but lived this program. And I don't want to say I had the honor because it was a tragedy, but I just want to say this. I identify with people who, in their own sobriety, if they found a dollar on the ground, it would be like 500 today. And if they found a 20, it would be like winning Powerball. That's how it was for me. A $20 bill, when I first got out of jail, was like winning Powerball. I didn't have a place to live for a long time. You know, I know that sand ashtrays in hotels are better to relight cigarettes because people don't step on them. You know, I know what it's like to be walking in and out of hotels in sobriety because I have no money and walking down hotel hallways and seeing a room service cart pushed outside and looking for somebody who didn't eat their whole hamburger or has a couple of extra chicken nuggets or french fries. I know what that's like. I don't like to admit that. That's not something I like to admit. But I can tell you this, when I think I have it rough today and I'm getting off my second flight of the day for work and my laptop is too heavy and my boss is an idiot, you know, and the airlines are late and I'm checking into a hotel and I'm walking down a hallway and I see a room service card outside, you can bet your ass that this alcoholic knows that I don't have too much to complain about today, you know. Um, Winston's daughter was brutally murdered in a triple homicide on, I want to say, March 10th of 1994. And um, she was running with the wolves, as we say, up in Harlem and involved with some bad people. And, um, you know, Winston didn't even pick up a cigarette. I still had to list in the back of my head when it's okay to drink finally. I knew there was a time. I knew you just weren't telling me. I knew there was some kind of special exception to the rule. But Winston went through that with dignity and grace. And... I learned how to pay back. See, because Winston had been there for a lot of us. And I learned that we all met at the Argo Diner at 90th and Broadway. And that somebody stayed with him during the day. And somebody went down to the morgue with him. And somebody went and bought clothes for his daughter to be in the casket. And somebody went to the funeral home with him. And we made sure that he was never alone, that we had round-the-clock coverage on Winston. And when I went to that funeral home for that wake, on the, it was the first AA wake I ever went to, and I looked around the room, I couldn't believe my eyes. You know, I couldn't believe my eyes because we were in the middle of Harlem and it looked like the United Nations. You know, the artists from downtown were there, the stockbrokers from the east side, the actors from the west side. Everybody was there. And I learned that that was an AA wake. And Winston went through that without picking up a drink. And not too far after that, my grandmother passed away. And um, I was active. I became a GSR. I was involved in young people's service ethic was put into me. And um, when my grandmother died, I didn't think I was going to go because Irish funeral and the whole bit. And this old guy at Chelsea Riverside said, Billy, you bet your ass you're going to go because if you don't, you may drink. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, because you have a responsibility to be a good son today. And your dad's mom died. And you should be there for him. And you should, if you don't have a suit and tie, borrow one. And you should find someone else in AA to go there with you because you can't go there alone. And you should go there and be there for your family. 
And then he said, what are they going to say to you, Billy? Sorry to hear you're not out screwing your life up anymore. You know, what are they going to say to you? Sorry to hear you're not in Suffolk County Jail anymore. You're going to go there and you're going to show them and be an example of what sobriety is doing in your life. Now, I have an aunt. My whole life growing up, I drank with her kids. Her kids were always staying with us because she was always locked up in a place called South Oaks. It's on Long Island. And South Oaks is a mental institution. And South Oaks, uh, my aunt was, she had, you know, the preferred frequent flyer. Um, <laughs> she was in and out. And uh, I never knew why. And my dad would be in an unmarked squad car with a beer between his legs, driving Aunt Sheila to the nut house and saying that sister's crazy, you know? I mean, it's just the way we lived. And uh, at my grandmother's funeral, you got to understand, I hadn't seen the, I hadn't seen a lot of the family because way before I got sober, I'd stopped showing up for weddings, stopped showing up for funerals. And my Aunt Sheila came down the stairs. I was now smoking Newports and uh, a lot of them. And um, my Aunt Sheila looked very, very different. And I had heard that she went back to college. I had heard that she got her Ph.D. from Teachers College at Columbia. I had heard she was now the vice dean of college for special education on Long Island. But I never knew what happened. But my Aunt Sheila, I knew how she was, and I had heard how she is today. And she came right down, and she walked over to me, and she said, Billy, how are you? She said, I heard you're getting sober. And I said, yeah, Aunt Sheila, I'm about two years sober. And she said, that's great, Billy. She said, I'm 14 years abstinent in OA and sober in AA. And she said, is that guy with you from AA? And I said, yes. And she said, so is that lady upstairs. She's from my group. You see, and I started to learn um, about, you know, what a miracle Alcoholics Anonymous is. And, you know, I've been graced with a life that's way beyond what I deserve. Um, friends in abundance. Um, close to my family. Uh, been given honor and privilege to serve some positions in AA. And, you know, it's funny because I just started a new position where I work, and there's a lot of books out now in the business community about inventory. It's very funny as I read them. And as an alcoholic and somebody that's done inventories, it's a little easier to use them, I think, for me, but it's very interesting. Um, you know, to me, the 12 steps are better than any self-help program out there. The 12 traditions are better than any team-building exercise you could ever go to. And the 12 concepts are better than any executive management week-long course you could ever go to. Those 36 principles are some of the most spiritually inspired principles you will ever find anywhere. Anywhere. And it's funny because I just started a new job and I have the tendency to do things Billy's way. My way or the highway. I know better. Um, and I've gone into this position taking you know, trying to take some of the stuff I've learned in AA with the steps in some of the leadership positions that I've held and use them in my job life. And what a wonderful transition this transition has been, different than any other I have. I have more responsibility than I've ever had before, and I have seven cities that I have people who report to me in. And what's amazing is that I was able to take what I looked at about myself, and I started doing this last year at my area assemblies. I had to pick one person who I knew didn't like me and ask them to give me feedback every other month about what they thought I did wrong and how I came across wrong to them or hard or overbearing or anything like that. Just like taking your own inventory. And what's amazing is I went into this job trying to identify the seven, these seven people, what things they've done great the last year. And I've had to make it a point to visit them all once in my first couple of months there, and I'm going there to tell them what I've found that they've done great. Instead of going there saying, you know what, you've done a horrible job. I'm much better at this than you are. Let's do it Billy's way. Because that doesn't win any friends. It doesn't help people like you. It doesn't help you be an effective worker among workers. If anything, it does exactly the opposite. And um, Alcoholics Anonymous, I talked about my parents and um, when I got the call that my mom was dying, I want to say that I don't know if it was the worst day I've ever had, but bad. And I remember exactly where I was pulled off the road because my sister called me and said to stop driving. 
And I remember when she told me that they had found stage four lung cancer inside my mother. And, um, you know, I remember just thinking that God hated me. And I remember thinking, it was my first impulsive thought, that I'm paying back for what I did. And, um, you know, all I can tell you today is that, like I said, I don't want to say that I'm glad my mother died, but I wouldn't trade back that eight months she was sick for anything. You know, I was ashamed to be walking around the supermarket with her alphabetical, alphabetized coupon box with all the kids whose parents didn't need coupons and on double or triple coupon day and all the stuff. And But I got to tell you that in that time my mother was dying, I grew to love her. I grew to like her for the woman she was. I grew to be in awe of her. I grew to believe that like the day that she would come to me maybe every three months and say that she had enough money to buy me a new pair of Levi's because that's all I would wear. I wanted a pair of Levi corduroys or I wanted a Levi jacket so I could get a spray painting of Ozzy Osbourne on the back, you know, <laughs> or I wanted a pair of black boots to watch my black, my de you know. When I think about my mother and how grateful she was to just buy me one pair of jeans, I would go home when she was sick, and I'd say, Mom, we can go out to eat anywhere tonight. And she would say, oh, it's, uh, it's whatever over, whatever age at Friendly is. Let's, and I'd be like, Mom, no, we can go anywhere. I'm paying. But no, that was her. That was her routine. I grew to love her for it. And I can tell you that as she started to leave this earth slowly, it was very, very painful for this alcoholic. Because I truly grew to love that lady. I mean, more than I had ever loved her in the world, ever. And now she was leaving. And, um, you know, I remember I, w I would pick her up. She'd always want me to be there when she got out of uh, the hospital because probably knowing that I'm the sickest because she knew that I would have a pack of cigarettes for her. Everybody else would give her a, everyone else would give her a hard time, you know. I'd have a pack of Kent 100s waiting for her and that stupid, like, rubber container she always used, the ones that split apart with the room for the matches. All the things that killed her about me, I grew to love, and I credit Alcoholics Anonymous for being able to do that to this to this young boy and then trying to become a man. And Christmas of 1999 was the greatest Christmas I've ever had in my life, ever. And, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, to be able to get voicemail messages and emails and hear from people who knew I was home with my mother, wishing me well, telling me to call, anything else like that. What a gift that is. What a gift it is to put the in my back pocket, print out a copy off the web where there are meetings near her hospice and put that in my back pocket and show up and just have AA there wherever you go in good times and bad. I mean... That's, I don't know if I ever deserved such a gift. And um, Christmas morning, I'll tell you this. The last time I really felt like drinking, and I'm not afraid to admit that. As somebody I heard in a meeting say a long time ago, I've gone to bed a lot of nights wanting to drink, and I've never woken up one morning wishing I had ever. But Christmas Eve was very difficult. And I wrapped my mother's last present ever, and I was devastated. And my sister and my two brothers and their significant others were drinking and because they can drink. Because guess what? They go to the hospital the next day when they drink on Christmas Eve. They don't go out till 3 in the morning with all the people they haven't seen in like 20 years on Christmas Eve. That's what happens to me when I pick up a drink on Christmas Eve. You know, and the next morning I woke up and I got my mother's lipstick and her Charlie perfume and her wig and her makeup and two tall Dunkin' Donuts coffees, and I got to the hospital, and I put her makeup on, and I thought to myself, boy, if all the gay guys from Midnight New York could see me now, boy, because <laughs> I wouldn't talk to them for a long time in that meeting. I always thought they were trying to get something from me, and I'm not trying to say that. I'm saying that because I'm a moron at best. And I'll tell you that my brother Terrence in this crazy Irish Catholic family told the family when I was four years sober that he was gay. And I had already known at that time that my job was only to be his brother, be his friend. And um, 
to be able to sit back on Christmas morning with my mom and throw back a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee, put on her lipstick and her makeup, have her crazy Irish music on her CD player for her, hang up all her Christmas cards, and have her give me her final instructions. What a gift. What a gift for her to tell me, Billy, no matter what you do, never leave AA. Ever. From a woman who rarely wanted to admit the existence of alcoholism in her family, ever. And, you know, when I close, I just got to tell you, it's funny how AA is and sobriety is in people's lives, because I don't know my aunts or my uncle's programs, you know? I don't know if they like to go to big book studies like I do. I don't know what pages in the big book they read. You know, because we're distant. I don't know about, I don't know what crosses they bear in their life. I know this. At my dad's funeral, he was buried on St. Patrick's Day. He timed it perfectly. We had the big screen TV and the restaurant party so all the family could watch the parade, God forbid. You know, and, you know, but my dad's funeral, my dad died with one leg, legally blind, liver distended, heart not working at age 62. And at age 25, when I was two years sober, I was wondering why God screwed me over and my dad could still drink and I couldn't. And at my dad's funeral, the three people who did the readings and the eulogy, two members of AA and one member of Alan on me and my dad's two sisters. I don't think that's any coincidence. I don't think it's any coincidence that the three people who are willing to participate and the three people who are able to show up are members of a 12-step program. When my mom passed away, and I'll close with this story, um, I remember going through the Lincoln Tunnel the last time I spoke with my mom. I kissed her goodbye, and I told her that it was okay to let go. And I cried from that hospice in the Bronx all the way leaving. Through the Lincoln Tunnel, I was playing Metallica, Hero of the Day. I got to a toll booth. The lady thought I was having a nervous breakdown. Um, and I drove home to Chicago, and I was at an area assembly when I got the page. And um, that she had passed away. And, you know, I never realized what a gift sobriety was until I buried my mother. And until I showed up and gave a eulogy at her funeral and told her how hard it was to a group just like this for a very far from perfect son to say goodbye to a very close to perfect mother. And um, I didn't have to drink. And my experience with the 12 steps and the 12 traditions and the 12 concepts is that I do not belong in a perfect and sobriety club and that I reach for those tools when I'm in pain. But the people who have helped me out the most are the people who have been through things and not drank. I believe in sobriety dates. I believe there's a reason for continuous sobriety. I do not believe that the person who got up the earliest this morning is the most sober. I, that's just not where I come from. If you got up earlier than me this morning and you were drinking cold 45 and baking up crack last night, I'm not going to ask you to sponsor me. That's just, you know? So that's just where I come from. I believe sobriety dates are there for a reason because I believe in my heart that God opens a window and that window is open for a period of time. And when you come through that window, you don't know if that window will ever open again. I don't know if it will ever open again. And I know that a lot of things happen when I pick up the drink. The one thing I can guarantee that happens is the second drink. I can't guarantee anything else. But a lot of things usually happen. And I learned something about my mother's family when my mom died that I found to be the scariest thing that I've learned since I've been an Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll leave you with this. I mentioned my Uncle Frank. I mentioned that he was the guy with the cards. I mentioned that he was the guy with the chips and the bookie's phone number. And whenever anyone asked what Uncle Frank did, no one wanted to answer it. He just, no one really would say. And Uncle Frank was the poster child for No Filter Paul Malls and Johnny Walker Black. In my family, he was the patriarch alcoholic. And what I found out is that Uncle Frank got sober at the same age I did, right after the Korea War. He had been in a very combat active unit in Korea. He had seen a lot of action. He had gotten into a lot of trouble, and he got sober in Brooklyn. And that for six years, he was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I talked to his, he has two younger twin brothers, who described how active he was, as active as I think I may be. Chair and detox meetings, going to meetings, 
taken commitments. They knew like all the lingo. And Uncle Frank died the furthest thing that I've ever pictured as a recovering member of this program. And I have to keep that in the back of my head. And that's why I mentioned that about my family. You know, there's a guy in New York, Bill B., he always says, you know, because you run into people and maybe they don't have to still have a home group. Maybe they don't have to work the steps. Maybe they don't read the big book. Maybe they're not involved in service. I have to believe for me that they're just not the same type of alcoholic as me. That's good enough for me. And Bill B. used to always say that to me. Billy, you're just not that kind of alcoholic. You can't survive on their sobriety. You need to do the things that you need to do. You need to wake up in the morning and say help. You need to go to bed at night and say thank you. You need to be reading out of the literature. You should be going to a big book meeting a week. You know, all the things that I was taught early on, you know, and I think back to Slogan Marty, and if there's anyone here, I don't know, I haven't spoken on East Coast in a lot, but I want to know if Slogan Marty is still around because Slogan Marty would drive you crazy because I'll tell you this, Slogan Marty would say that complacency in Alcoholics Anonymous kills people. And he would say, and he would take a wallet out of his back pocket and he would hold it up. And he would say that when he came to AA, he didn't have a wallet, much like most of us. And some of us that those have, do have wallets, there's nothing of our own that's inside it. And he would say that when he came to AA, AA was his social life. And I identified with that because I would go to meetings because I had nowhere else to go. Because I have nowhere else to go. You know, I don't know what they call it in Pennsylvania or in Illinois. They call welfare a link card. We always joke around. You're not going to take anyone out to the movies on a link card, you know. So your ass is in a, move, is, is in a meeting. So your social life, my social life, depended upon meetings. My budget for food depended upon coffee and cookies in certain meetings. And, and you know, it's funny, but it's, it's the truth. But Slogan Marty would say that what happens to us is we get a wallet in our back pocket, we get an ATM card in there, we get a couple of dollars, and it rubs our ass in that meeting, and it tells me, Billy, you can be on a date. You can be at a concert. You can be here. You can be anywhere but in a meeting. And I know that happens to me. And he says that's complacency. And complacency in Alcoholics Anonymous means come place your ass in a chair. And I've never forgotten that, you know. <laughs> I've never forgotten that since I heard him say that. And there's a lot of men and women that I need to thank. And um, by the grace of God in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm sober tonight. And sometimes it was because of meetings that looked perfect and meetings that looked pretty. And other times it was places like Midnight in New York City that may not look perfect and may not look pretty, and hell might freeze over and you might get a GSR report, but it saves lives, you know? There is a message in there, and it, the message is a message of hope. And I know for me, what worked for me 10 years ago might not work for me today. I felt comfortable in midnight. It was dark. It was dreary. People were nuts. It had everything except the tap. Everything except the keg. But it saved my life. It saved my life. And I know today that all my problems today are things I prayed for years ago. That's all my problems are today. You know, my goal today in life, some people know this, I used to get on my knees at night and say, God, when is my life going to be more than meetings and meetings and diners and diners and commitments and meetings, and more meetings, and stupid diners. I mean, now I would love to be able to go to three meetings a day, seven days a week. That old life that I had as a newcomer, it looked so attractive. No one ever told me about bills, and dry cleaning, and shining your shoes, and having a resume, and being a worker among workers, and that it doesn't matter how smart you are, that people like you to be there. Being smart is good, but being there is more important. Being there on time is even more important. Showing up early and leaving late at work is really good. I learned all those things here. And I am eternally grateful for that. I don't know if I would have learned them anywhere else. I don't know that if I could have went on my first interview, that I didn't know that God can't help you get a job if you're not filling out applications and putting out resumes. You just can't get on the knees in the Belclare Hotel at night and say, God, I need a job. You know, you got to get up in the morning and fill out a resume and, and, and fill out applications, you know. You know, things like that I learned from men and women in this program who just walked the walk before I did, you know, and had been down the road. So that's my message to you. If you have a problem in your life that you haven't dealt with, I'm not telling you to do a public fifth step. Lots of us are guilty of that early sobriety. 
What I'm telling you is this. There's people in AA who have the experience. The IRS, whatever else. My experience with the IRS, I never met a more grateful organization for Alcoholics Anonymous in my life than the IRS. That was my experience. I mean, I went to New York and worked out my plan and paid them back, but what other organization is sending people to walk right in the door and say, you know what, you've been sending me letters, I've been ripping them up, yeah, every time you lean my salary, I switch jobs so it takes you six months to catch up to me. What other place in the world sends us there and says, you know what, I've been a mess up, I'm trying to clean up my life, I'm trying not to drink a day at a time, I need to pay you back to stay sober, I don't have all the money I owe you today. But you know how I learned about that? From other men in AA who ripped up letters, had their salaries leaned, switched jobs, just like when I buried my mother sober. The one most important piece of advice I was given was, Billy, do not let your pocketbook prevent you from doing what you should be doing. And what he meant was, and what I did was, don't be afraid to take two weeks a month off. Don't be afraid to dwindle down that 401k. Don't be afraid to get rid of a couple of dollars in your savings account. What you will not be able to live with is any regrets. And that's what you need to watch out for. You need to act in your life today with your mother dying as a sober young man because you might not be able to live with the regrets if you just deal with it like you usually deal with things. And um, of all the podiums I've ever been in front of, and this is no slight doubt, folks, anonymous, the greatest one I've ever been at is at my mother's funeral and being able to say goodbye to her and asking everyone to get up and give her a round of applause. I've been given no greater honor in my life. And um, if you're new and struggling, find somebody tonight. My experience at conferences, for me, this is the most unimportant hour and ten minutes of the weekend. For me. I'll meet somebody in a room, in a bathroom, somewhere, where I'll have a conversation that will change my life. That's my experience at conferences. That there's someone here that I need to speak to, Maybe there's more than one person, but I need to come and show up when I speak at a conference and believe that the hour I speak is the most important hour of the weekend for me. It's just not important for me. I'm here to be a member of AA, to meet some of you, to talk to some of you, to maybe you're going through something that I've been through, or maybe you've gone through something that I'm currently going through. And that's what this life saves. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.